Welcome to the second episode of Modern Aikidoist Podcast. The first episode got some great responses and we're looking to expand. So as of the time we put this podcast out, we're distributing through iTunes and Stitcher, which are podcast uh, outlets, as well as YouTube. Uh, so we're going to be adding some content for, for both of those. So strap in and let's get started with Aikido myths which need to die. There are many fundamental concepts taught in the Aikido world and indeed in all the martial arts. Oftentimes these are expressed as maxims, uh, statements of, of obvious truth or fundamental truth. The problem is that only some of them are, are accurate. Some are partially accurate and others are flat out false. Let's start with an easy example. The old maxim which is always accepted as truth, practice makes perfect. Well is it? What if you are repeating the wrong motions? In my experience, I've found that when people practice the same motion incorrectly <clears throat> for months or years, oftentimes it takes months or years to undo and unlearn the patterns that they've burned in. So I find that a even better expression of this concept is practice makes permanent. Whatever you practice, that is how you will perform and what your body will go to and what your mind will go to under stress. A student can easily think, well, if I just practice more and I keep practicing and I keep practicing, then I will become perfect. But without the guidance, without the focus on making sure that their practice is as good as it can be, and they can fulfill their potential by having their practice be very effective, working on the right movements, the correct responses, and building up the real skill that will lead them to success and mastery. As we can see, the old myth of practice makes perfect is not entirely accurate. It's not terribly far off, but there's a little more to it than meets the eye. So let's get into one of the biggest myths, if not probably the worst one, about Aikido. And there's many ways to express it, but basically the belief that Aikido is purely defensive art, it's merely for establishing peace, uh, it lacks offense, and it is primarily pacifist in nature. The idea that the founder of Sensei was a pacifist is a myth that was busted by his own son. There's a, a great quote by Ellis Mdur Sensei uh, who wrote up on IkeWeb, and I, I'll read the, read the quote here. I recall a presentation Second Doshu gave to the Japan Martial Arts Society in the 1980s, and someone raised his hand and asked just when it was that O Sensei became a pacifist. After the translation, Doshu looked rather puzzled and asked for clarification, and the question was asked again. Doshu seemed to be suppressing giggles and said, in effect, that his father was never a pacifist, nor was Aikido a pacifist practice. Seems pretty clear that since O Sensei's death, the Aikido culture has transformed itself very heavily towards the uh, pacifist type impressions and, and beliefs. The underlying truth shatters the myth about Aikido being a pacifist art or purely defensive or that the founder endorsed pacifism. Another common claim of Aikido is that it is not about fighting and it's not designed for self-defense. And this is probably related to the, the pacifist influence within the Aikido culture. But I think this one is distilled pretty easily from the, amount, the number of achievements that O Sensei had, the fact that he never backed down from uh, a challenge or displaying his art. He never failed to impress top level martial artists who, who trained with him or crossed paths with him or even challenged him. Often they would ask him immediately to become his student because they were so impressed by his skills. A third related myth, uh, and I believe this touches on the pacifist uh, vein as well, is that you can willingly avoid violence by being peaceful or being a good negotiator who can de-escalate a tense situation or resolve a conflict merely by talking it out or just walking away. This is partially true and by and large it can be done. The choice of engaging in violence sometimes is not yours. Somebody else does it and they don't care what you think and they will be violent regardless of your best efforts of negotiating or de-escalating. It is those situations which are why we train hard so that when somebody else makes the choice to commit violence, we can put an end to it as quickly as possible. A very common statement about Aikido is that it must be studied for decades before it's useful for self-defense or that a practitioner is capable enough to be useful with it. What's true is that Aikido is a complex art and it does not master it quickly. It does take time to do it, but that said, I think creating the expectation in a student's mind that they're gonna spend years 
investing in themselves in this art to get nothing out of it until they get 10, 15, or 20 years into practice is demoralizing. I think it's something that turns people off to Aikido, and there's great room for us to improve that message. Like practicing music, yes, it takes quite a while before starting to learn guitar, for example, you become good enough with guitar to go and play an improv or play in a band, do a performance. But time is well spent in investing in yourself, and it should be an enjoyable journey. And having students believe that they won't get anything out of their time for 8, 10, 12, 15 years is just not a good message to, to start with, and it's not appealing to students. We as teachers and instructors should take it as our personal challenge to make sure that students are getting useful skills in a short amount of time. They don't need to be masters, but they should feel that every time they go to a class, every week, every month, they are advancing, they're getting better, their capabilities are expanding. They should view what they are taught with wonder and appreciation of the competence that a good teacher will give them. Now I want to cover some of the uh, other myths that we tend to get on the mat, because uh, some of these are that I've talked about already are philosophical or historical. Let's get into some of the ones that we run into pretty commonly in our training. One of the big ones here is that Aikido does not require strength. Well, any movement of your body requires strength for you to move your body around. And if your body is very weak, you will tend to move slowly. You'll tend to move sluggishly. Uh, you will lack the ability to move your own weight, uh, even just your own weight, not even the weight of another person who may be grabbing you, who may be wrapped up in you, who may be trying to push you or, or drag you around. So the idea that Aikido does not require strength is inaccurate. Now, it doesn't require that you have a massive amount of strength, although Osensei did. Uh, Osensei was uh, reportedly extraordinarily strong, and his students really did not want to get hit by him because he hit very, very hard. And so as we look at what we want from our own Aikido, having a firm, strong, fit, athletic body is a tremendous asset. In any martial art, you will always do better by having more strength, more flexibility, more quickness. All of these things are related to strength. So the idea that one can be a, a total weakling and still do Aikido, you know, you can, but it won't be as effective as if you have the strength to move your body quickly, move it fluidly, be able to change directions quickly and easily. And all that comes from the use of strength. Related to this is the idea that Aikido allows a smaller person to deal with a much larger attacker. Uh, again, this is partially true, but as we know with, with martial arts in general, size matters. If somebody outweighs you, is much bigger than you are, it will be a tremendous challenge for you to overcome their, their additional size and probably strength. Now, when it comes to, comes to dealing with that, if you have a tremendous skill advantage, that skill advantage can help balance the scales, but the weight is, is not to be overlooked as being a tremendous advantage to the person who's, who's bigger. We need to be realistic here in the expectation that we create. Yes, Aikido can be tremendously effective with smaller people who are not as big or strong as their opponent, <clears throat> but they have to make up for that with good movement and being very, very smart. Use the advantage that they have and try to, as best they can, blunt the disadvantages that they have against a larger person. A common myth is that Aikido doesn't use striking, such as kicks or punches uh, or anything that was viewed as quote-unquote harmful. Aikido does include a temi. A temi are strikes that are designed to unbalance an opponent, not necessarily hurt them, although they might. But even, Osensei, Gozo Shioda, some of the major uh, principal students of Osensei all agreed that, that a temi have a, play a major role in Aikido. Now, there's some dispute over what percentage. It goes as high as 99%. I've read 95%. I've read 90%, down to about 75%, I believe, is what Gozo Shioda said that, that Aikido consists of in terms of a temi. What the number is exactly, I guess, really doesn't matter so much as look at the majority. Those are high numbers that every single one of those people seem to have conveyed, that striking is a major part of Aikido which is true for any combat art, any martial art, any martial sport, that 
I suppose with the exception of wrestling, uh, which specifically restricts striking. But by and large, when you talk about human combat or hoplology, striking is very crucial. And if any martial art overlooks that on purpose, then there's going to be a big hole in the capability of that art. A major myth is the idea that throwing someone to the ground is gentle or somehow non-injurious. The truth is that there's nothing that hits harder than the planet. And throwing somebody to the ground can cause great injury, particularly when they have no okemi skills or they have no experience with rolling or tumbling or being thrown. Uh, judo has got tremendous throws and is very powerful. And many practitioners have a hard time practicing for a great number of years without sustaining long-term damage to their joints and their bodies. And Aikido does a great job with uh, teaching the okemi and having throws that can be rolled out of safely. And it's a great sustainable practice. But the idea of throwing somebody to the ground just as a pure concept, uh, is that causes a lot of damage and will cause a lot of injury. In fact, in the police reports of what they call one-punch kills or one-punch death, usually it was related to things like bar fights and and street violence, usually the death is not from the punch. It's when the person is punched, the victim is punched and knocked out or browned out, and then they fall and they hit their head on pavement or on a door frame on, on something metal, and they crack their head, their brain hemorrhages, and they wind up dying. It's the fall that does more of the damage than the punch or the kick or the strike or the push. And that's something we need to appreciate and it's something I think a lot of Aikidoists experience when they have a new student that comes in who doesn't know how to take ukemi, and they hurt themselves even trying to learn basic roles, much less get thrown into a role that they don't know how to get out of. Speaking of the ground, another great myth is that an Aikidoist can consciously choose not to go to the ground because of his superior footwork and movement. It's true that good movement and good positioning can make it much more difficult to take you to the ground. However, nobody's perfect, and as we see with fights all the time, oftentimes they do wind up on the ground. It's also incorrect to say that all fights end on the ground. Many fights do, but many fights don't. One myth that I find particularly bothersome is the uh, statement, if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't work. Perhaps a better way to put it might be, if it hurts, it works, which I've also heard taught. Note that these two statements are quite different in their meaning even though they sound very similar. And I think one probably came from the other, although I'm not sure which is the chicken or which is the egg in this instance. Either way, the concept of causing pain to end a fight is valid and time-tested. However, it is kind of a wild card. Sometimes you can get somebody to back down by causing them a bit of pain and because they don't want to experience any more of it, and they leave. Problem is, the other type of person, which when they receive pain, they just become more motivated to engage in another attack or escalate into a greater level of violence. So it's hard to know before you apply that pain what the outcome will be. It might solve your problem and it might make it 10 times worse. What I believe at this point is controlling the skeleton is a far superior tool and sometimes can keep people from escalating into greater violence because you control their balance, you control their position, and you can immobilize them without motivating them into greater levels of anger. That said, professionals who work daily with violence, such as security officers, police officers, and the like, will often say that pain is a necessary tool in certain circumstances, so should not be overlooked. Now I'd like to cover probably the single most dangerous myth in the Aikido world, and even really in the martial arts world. Really, it's a set of teachings and an attitude about dealing with weapons, in particular knives and swords. The subject of knives, swords, and disarms is a pretty long one, so I think I'm going to save it for the next episode. So for now, thanks for watching and listening. Like and subscribe this podcast and like it on YouTube. And until the next episode, enjoy your training.